Good afternoon. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Happy to welcome you here today to this Medical Center Hour, a program called Beyond Healthcare Reform, Implications for Academic Medicine. It's been almost 11 months since President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law. Yet the healthcare environment seems just as unsettled now as it was during the lengthy debate that led to its passage. Thanks in part to the 2010 congressional election results and a raft of court cases disputing parts or all of the law's constitutionality. While all this can make it hard to predict precisely the outcome of the reform effort, or to see clearly what a system overhaul will look like organizationally and practically, many stakeholders in the healthcare industry are looking ahead to ascertain just how the reform effort will change them and how they might best accommodate, even capitalize on, whatever reform brings their way. Academic medicine is one community watching the reform effort with some anticipation, even some anxiety. How is healthcare reform going to affect medical schools and university-based health systems? What is and what will likely be its impact? In our Medical Center Hour today, Jeff Goldsmith, one of the nation's leading health industry analysts, explores the major uncertainties at the heart of healthcare reform right now, particularly the fate of the Medicaid expansion, the regulatory pressures on the private health insurance industry, and the effect of the entire package on academic medicine. Jeff Goldsmith is well known to us here. He's president of Health Futures Incorporated based in Charlottesville and associate professor of public health sciences here at UVA. He's been an invaluable resource as an analyst and commentator on change in the healthcare industry. Just last fall, I heard him give a marvelously clear assessment of the healthcare reform effort for an audience in the law school. But that was ahead of the November elections and ahead of the court cases, which have changed the game at least a little. So we've invited Professor Goldsmith here today to give us the skinny on things as they are now with healthcare reform. Again, with an eye out especially for how all this is playing and will play with academic health centers, these large, complicated, yet somehow also fragile, and sometimes not so nimble organizations that bear responsibility for so much of this nation's professional education in healthcare, for health-related health research, and for healthcare delivery. Um, so I think we're in for, um, we've had a couple of medical center hours earlier this year that have been sort of very breathless tours through very complicated um, stories, and I think uh, we're in for um, a lot of information in a short amount of time, and please welcome uh, Jeff Goldsmith. I think this will be a treat. Thanks, Marcia, very much. Good, good afternoon to all of you. It's really good to be here. This is my fifth Medical Center hour. The first one was in 1982. Uh, I was here with Bob Heisel from Johns Hopkins, and uh, it was uh, instrumental in my moving here. And it was friendly people in a beautiful community. This, however, is a dangerous topic, and one which, I, I must say, people have either completely zoned out, uh, or they've gotten to a pitch of anger about this process that makes it very hard to talk objectively about what's actually happening to us as a society and, and the implications for us. I, I'm wondering how we get my presentation moved about. There it is, awesome. Um, it, it has been, you know, if you think back a year ago, uh, we were just post uh, Scott Brown uh, taking over Ted Kennedy's Senate seat in Massachusetts. A, uh, that would help, you know, bring the lights down a little bit also. Um, <clears throat> and, and a clear signal that the country was moving in a, a rightward uh, direction. Um, and we were also watching the Olympics. And those of us uh, may remember uh, kind of wondering, I, I love this uh, cartoon, about how the president was actually going to land this jump, uh, <laughs> since it wasn't obvious exactly how. Uh, and yet, um, a little more than a month later, uh, this colossal 2,900-page uh, bill lands on his desk, and he signs it into law, the Affor uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. I want you to know I have read this bill twice. 
<coughs> from front to back, <coughs> and I have a surgical PDF copy of the bill on my uh, desktop, which I've been into maybe weekly in the ensuing 11 months. So I feel like I've become kind of a Talmudic scholar of what's in here. <laughs> I really have, if anything, an excessive feel for what they did. Um, I can tell you, I believe uh, there were noble impulses in this legislation uh, and noble objectives, things that needed to happen. And I think it's ironic <clears throat> that there's been so much uh, storm about the legislation that we've lost sight of the fact that 30 million people, 10% of the country, are eventually going to get health insurance coverage as a result of this law. Um, uh, but also, I think importantly, uh, uh, long overdue renovations of our public programs, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, a lot of changes in the signals sent to our provider community and health system about what we want it to do, better or differently, uh, and uh, an effort to try and modernize our uh, infrastructure to get us really into the late 20th century in how we handle and manage information in the care process. A lot of really important stuff. And yet, in swathed in 2,900 pages of almost completely unreadable legislative language, you wade through it, and the, the, the impression that the bill gives you is not of an eagle or a lion or a warthog. Uh, it's, it's more like <laughs> <laughs> this um, a gelatinous deep sea creature. This is a um, um, blobfish whose principal bi form of biological defense is uh, that it's inedible. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I, it's worth noting, because I mean, someone's going to bring this up later on. I, I'm not one of those Tea Party people. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I voted for President Obama twice. I came from the same tiny community that both Michelle and, and Barack came from, the University of Chicago, which is about the same size as this place. Um, my last job uh, before I, I uh, moved off into uh, being a consultant was to be the planning and government affairs person at the University of Chicago Medical Center, which was the last job that Michelle Obama held before she went to, to Washington. They're virtually family. Uh, so what you're going to hear from me this, this afternoon isn't partisan, you know, a partisan hack job. It's a you know, reasonably bloodless assessment of what they did rather than something that's aimed at, uh, at the president. Um, this was the author of the legislation, uh, Senator Max Baucus from Montana, speaking to some angry constituents in his home state uh, the uh, uh, last uh, September. This is the father of the legislation. Mark my words, several years from now, you're going to look back and say, well, that wasn't so bad after all. That's what you say after colonoscopy, <laughs> um, or just before colonoscopy. Um, and I've actually read the bill twice more than the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, I believe this was deeply flawed legislation. Um, it, it, is, it is an astonishing bureaucratic project. Uh, that's the number one thing that strikes you after wading through it front to back. Um, easily 20,000 pages of regulations need to, need to be written to implement this bill, plus the cooperation of a very large number of state governors and legislatures, which lurched profoundly in the direction of Republican control in this last election. So there are now 33. Republican governors. Uh, there were 700 more Republican legislators after uh, the November election than there were before, uh, and most of those Republican governors have actually signed on to the legal efforts to try and kill the bill uh, through the courts. Um, I think from a, from a, a tactical standpoint, uh, a grievous flaw was that it delayed the crucial deliverables, that is signing people up for health coverage and making changes in how health care is paid for by three and a half years that is an eternity in politics. I can tell you in Massachusetts, it was seven months from the passage of Massachusetts health reform legislation to actually giving people coverage. That made an enormous amount of difference because people could actually say, hey, look, this really helped me. I think there are a lot of people who are going to be helped by this bill that don't believe they're going to be helped by it and probably won't until they actually sign up. So I think that was, uh, has really weakened it politically. Uh, it was financed by a capital gains tax increase and an implicit tax on the wage base, that is the penalties on employers uh, if they don't, if their people uh, try to get coverage through the exchanges. I can, I was, I was absolutely down the line with Zeke Emanuel, whose talk I heard here a couple, you know, maybe 18 months ago. Zeke believed that if you wanted to do this, you had to do it off the wage base. 
um, his proposal was to use a consumption tax. I would have been a little more focused and gone after soft drinks and trans fats, just to be really clear about what we were talking about when we meant consumption. Um, but you know, if you're trying to get a recovery in the economy, the absolute last thing you do is, make, is reduce the after-tax return on capital invested and make it more expensive to employ people, which were the two principal mechanisms for funding this bill. Um, it did nothing meaningful. And part of the reason why I went through it twice was just to be absolutely certain. It did nothing meaningful to reduce health costs. It did launch some experiments, which we'll be talking about here in a minute. But other than the uh, changes in the updates for hospitals uh, and for health plans, uh, there was no significant change in the inflationary uh, underpinnings of our health care payment system in, the, in, in this bill. I believe it excessively depended upon Medicaid expansion. Uh, more than half the coverage expansion is going to come through Medicaid, perpetuating deep inequities and threatening state and academic health center finances. And the only reason why the bill depended as much on Medicaid uh, in proportion to the total mix of people that got coverage was because they, they dramatically underpay providers of care for rendering services to the Medicaid population. And the reason why they can do that is because the people they're taking care of are poor and poorly represented. And then finally, and I, another thing that I think I very much agreed with Zeke about, it reinforced and complicated rather than reduced the role of employers in the health benefit. If you recall Zeke, basically said we need, we need an individual mandate, but we also need to get the employer out of the middle. We basically need to get, you know, you know to eliminate employer-based coverage. And though it, it, this bill kind of did that through the back door, I believe that many more than the 8 or 10 million Americans that were estimated by the CBO to lose employer-based coverage because it will be so much better a deal for people to go through the exchanges. Uh, we just didn't go the rest of the way. Uh, and I think we're going to pay a price for that in the implementation. It's also, this bill is also a political albatross. Uh, the White House has forecast that uh, people would warm to the legislation once they've gotten used to it a year on. Uh, almost half, exactly half the population have an unfavorable impression of it. And if you take apart, uh, this is the Kaiser Family Foundation tracking poll from uh, about a month ago. Um, the number of people with a favorable impression of health reform has declined by five points uh, since the bill was enacted. And if you look inside the Democratic uh, poll numbers, a significant number of Democrats believe that this bill was a sellout uh, to the health insurance industry, either because it didn't implement a single payer system or it didn't create a public option that would have diverted a significant number of privately insured people into a Medicare-like public plan. So the Democratic base doesn't like the bill. The Republican base is literally on fire. And it's become one of the organizing uh, principles of a full-scale insurrection in our political system, uh, at which uh, we saw last November <coughs> conveyed one House of Congress to Republican control, I think with 23 seats up, uh, 23 Democratic seats up uh, in uh, November of next year. I think the high likelihood is that the, Rep the Senate will follow. Uh, and put this bill in a really uh, tenuous position. Um, it is true that the neither House will have the votes to repeal the legislation, uh, and the Republican campaign platform of repeal and replace is to me completely disingenuous because they don't have the votes to, to repeal it, and they don't have anything to replace it. Uh, and it, it's clear that there isn't even a clear vision of the problem that needs to be solved uh, in, uh, when, when you kind of uh, tease through it. And so where we stand with the legislation today is it's sort of like Godzilla versus Megalon there. Um, I wanted to get the smog monster, but he didn't photograph very well. <laughs> it was kind of indistinct. Um, it, is, um, it, it is going to be very difficult to get the Congress that is coming increasingly under Republican control to appropriate the money necessary to make this uh, legislation actually happen. And so if you're a, a large academic health center or a pharmaceutical company or a large physician group or a health plan, and you're trying to plan for what's actually going to happen, there is so much political uncertainty right now, the, the whole process is pretty much hostage to a, 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 an increasingly uh, turbulent political climate. But thinking about the issues that are sort of unavoidable here, um, I think there are four uh, that if you worry about the fate of academic medicine, you need to think hard about and to, to, to speculate about what might happen. And these are the four I'm going to be talking about. 
Um, with deficit reduction, it's worth noting the president's budget that uh, that was uh, passed this uh, that was uh, put out uh, by the uh, administration earlier this week envisioned a 1.1 trillion dollar deficit for the fiscal year that ends next uh, um, uh, next fall. Uh, that's on top of a 1.5 trillion dollar budget deficit for the year we're in. 1.1 trillion for the year before that. I mean, we will have had four trillion dollar plus deficits uh, in four years. Um, clearly, uh, there are um, big issues for academic medicine. <clears throat> uh, academic institutions got a big chunk of the money that we're borrowing. Uh, the biggest, I, among the biggest beneficiaries of the stimulus in the health system were, were academic institutions. Um, stimulus aided a 15% expansion in Medicaid, people that would otherwise have been uncompensated and therefore you wouldn't have had any payment at all for. Uh, got Medicaid coverage as a result of the stimulus. There was a big pulse uh, of, I think, a, a billion dollars uh, of NIH funding uh, for biomedical research in the stimulus bill. And actually, the president's budget uh, that came out earlier this week has a further, I think, almost $700 billion million increase in the NIH budget. Um, uh, uh, the stimulus also created uh, something called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is um, one of the most important infrastructure investments, this was $400, billion, $400 million uh, to fund uh, research on comparative effectiveness of just about anything we do in, in, in medicine. Uh, drugs, uh, devices, uh, clinical protocols, uh, uh, healthcare delivery ideas, uh, with the notion that we really need to use a scientific basis for making decisions about what we pay for and ultimately the more contentious topic, how much. Uh, there is, I have a whole hour on PCORI and on what, what uh, the role that comparative effectiveness plays in uh, the, these reforms, but uh, academic institutions were going to be the beneficiaries of most of the money that was going to be spent by this agency, an agency that is already uh, very high on the Republican hit list. Uh, there are clearly contrasting visions of deficit reduction. I don't need to put any partisan labels on these, but uh, thinking about them, uh, you know, we really have a lot at stake. When people talk about discretionary domestic spending and the need to cut it as opposed to defense or entitlements, it's important to remember that NIH funding is discretionary spending. And a 20% cut of the NIH budget would take $6 billion away from academic institutions to do both basic and, uh, and translational clinical, clinical and basic science research. So, you know, when you, you, you can hear these discussions about the need to control uh, discretionary domestic spending, a huge piece of the mission of these institutions uh, is funded by that money. Uh, Medicare uh, is the balancing item in the federal budget, and until you hear people making serious discussions about how to use Medicare funding more effectively, there really won't be a serious discussion about, uh, you, you will be able to judge that it wasn't a serious discussion. Uh, a lot of my friends in Washington in the lobbying community that lobby for hospitals or lobby for physicians believe they bought themselves 10 years worth of immunity from further reductions in their Medicare payments by agreeing to participate in and support health reform. I can tell you I don't believe that uh, is going to last. Uh, it is clear that there is going to have to be a second bite taken out of Medicare. And the question is whether it is after or before this next election. Uh, and a greater concern, Medicaid is the balancing item in state budgets. Uh, and those budgets will be cut when states reach the end of the stimulus funding pulse for Medicaid, which adjusted the matching formula for federal versus state contribution to Medicaid, I think it was like a five-point bounce, in the, maybe more than five points, in the direction of the federal government. That pulse of funding expires in June of this year. And every state in the union, including states with growing economies like Texas, are going to be making adjustments in their Medicaid programs as a result of the expiration of that stimulus funding. <clears throat> the Medicaid expansion. Uh, budget limits forced Congress to rely on Medicaid for as much as 50% of the total coverage growth. Uh, estimates vary, but between 15 and 20 million new, uh, uh, newly covered people will be covered by the nation's Medicaid program. Um, I have dealt with Medicaid for 35 years. My first job in academic medicine was to defend the University of Chicago, which had 32% of its patients as Medicaid patients. 
from cuts in state and federal funding. It has been a nonstop 35-year nightmare. And instead of reforming the program, uh, what this uh, bill did was expand the number of Medicaid recipients by 30% uh, and did so uh, with the idea that the newly covered people uh, would be 90% federal matched eventually, 100% federal matched until 2016, <coughs> negotiations with the governors, under the assumption that our economies and state government budgets would have recovered by then and they'd be able to assume an additional very substantial financial burden. Um, by some estimates, however, there are 12 million more people who are eligible for Medicaid right now under the existing matching formula, where states pay anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the cost, that when we get to 2014 and people go through the health exchanges as they are required to do under law to get coverage, the health exchanges will assign those 12 million people to the Medicaid program that have incomes below 133% of poverty. And the match for those folks won't be 90-10 or 100% federal, it will be 60-40 or 50-50. So every state governor that's sitting there now with a huge Medicaid funding problem realizes they have another huge Medicaid funding problem coming in 2014, regardless of what happens to the economy, and they are working very hard with their congressional representatives either to postpone or delay or to scale back this coverage expansion or to give them unprecedented flexibility in how they pay for services under the program so that they can cover a whole lot more people without uh, any more money. Um, the, the Affordable Care Act forbade states from shrinking eligibility between now and 2014, which was a sensible thing to do. You don't want to shrink down and then grow again. But what, where that's left states now is that the only way they can balance their budgets is either by eliminating benefits like dental care, vision, hearing, you name it, or by cutting payments to providers and, and under the existing benefit package. Uh, so states are really in a vice, uh, and, and there is a lot of pressure right now. Uh, the state of Arizona has a um, waiver request into the federal government to permit them to reduce eligibility that's going to be a test of whether the uh, administration is going to defend that maintenance of effort provision that is creating uh, so much uh, controversy and fear in state budget offices. And it's worth noting that before I was at the University of Chicago, I worked in a state budget office for three years during the middle of a recession. And Medicaid was, of course, something we worried a lot about. Um, as we said, states were shielded initially from the cost of this expansion, but began taking on their ultimate share in 2016. But the issue of how the 12 million people that are eligible now get dealt with is something that people are worrying about right now. So even states whose governors are fiercely opposed to this bill and opposed to the idea of creating a, a state health insurance exchanges as they are required to under the law, realize that if they don't create the exchanges, and control the process by which people are assigned to health insurance, they've completely lost control of their Medicaid enrollment and can't afford to do that. So a lot of the betting in my circle now is how, how hard are states going to work to make it uh, difficult for these newly entitled Medicaid beneficiaries to enroll? There really is going to be a struggle between the provider community, which wants to cover and take care of the population, and state governors that, as we saw with the ESCHIP program, really haven't been enthusiastic marketers of the program's eligibility to try and cover the people that are entitled uh, to uh, care under the existing statute. And to put it mildly, the expansion of this program is politically fraught for all of the reasons we've been discussing. The Republicans in the Medicaid expansion, there's 33 state governors that are basically trying to kill the thing in, in court. I think if the, even if the individual mandate uh, is knocked out, you've still got this issue of whether to move ahead with the uh, Medicaid expansion in 2014. I actually had a chance to talk to a new freshman uh, 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 congressman, uh, who, uh, a Republican congressman from Arizona who's coming in, and I asked him directly, how committed are you and your caucus to the expansion of eligibility under this program? And I got a lot of mumbling. Uh, he basically talked about, well, what can we afford? Uh, that was uh, the answer to my question. Or uh, state, uh, the, the fallback position, if they can't kill the expansion, is to change the Medicaid program into a block grant, 
which would have the effect of, of eliminating federal oversight virtually over how and how much uh, providers are paid. Um, the block grant is a license to butcher academic health center payment rates either directly or through draconian managed care conversions. That is uh, basically saying outsourcing the management of the programs to health plans. Care system payment and payment system redesign. The policy community has been searching for uh, decades for a successor to fee-for-service payment for Medicare. And we've heard all the familiar arguments about fee-for-service encourages people to render care that isn't necessary, all of that. But they don't really know what to do. There's no consensus on what to do. And after 15 years of not really funding the care system experiments and pilots and demonstration programs, we don't have on the shelf, ready to go, new payment models that we could use to replace fee-for-service. And so what this bill did is it basically said, well, let's try 20 things and see what works. And as a consequence, there's massive uncertainty in the provider community, not just here, but everywhere, about how they're going to get paid by Medicare in uh, a very few period of years. And it's worth saying that if if the health services research community sees uh, an innovation from the Medi Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center that quote works, close quotes, and I put it in quotes because it's not clear exactly how works is going to be defined, they have expedited authority to simply implement it without going back to Congress. Uh, that's also deeply controversial and uh, one of the big battles over uh, confirming Don Berwick is, well, what would Berwick do with this authority? Because Don knows more, has forgotten more about how the care system works and how incentives affect people's behavior in the care system than many of the people in Congress know. So what we're going to see here in the next 18 months to two years is what I call a stampede of hobby horses. There are literally dozens of ideas here, um, and I, some of them are great ideas um, that, are, that have as their goal try to improve care coordination, try to reduce the dropped batons in the care process, trying to make sure that uh, people are cared for in a, in a safer manner, uh, that uh, families are better equipped to manage patients once the patient is out of the acute phase of an illness. Uh, the medical home is in here. There are a ton of ideas. One interesting one that Hopkins got snuck into this bill was the healthcare innovation zone. This is for like urban teaching hospitals that can kind of work together with community health centers and other community-based providers to create kind of an all-payer care environment for a neighborhood around the health center uh, at the University of Chicago. I can tell you we would have been all over this. In fact, Michelle created something called the Urban Health Initiative, uh, which was an alliance with our community hospitals and our public health systems on the south side of Chicago that anticipated that something like this would happen. So I don't want you to walk away from this uh, talk believing that there aren't a lot of good ideas in here. Uh, the problem is that one of those ideas has so completely overshadowed all of the others that it's kind of become the emblem of care system uh, redesign, uh, and that is the Medicare Shared Savings Program, uh, uh, the so-called Accountable Care Organization uh, Program, which is basically like managed care, only without the risk. <laughs> it's a shared savings program for um, groups that can take over a population of people without their knowing it. And if they can manage to reduce the rate of increase in Medicare spending, they'll get some of the uh, di difference between a reference rate of increase and what they actually did back as a bonus. See, I couldn't make that. I couldn't even say it in English, <laughs> what it is. If you can't explain it to your mom, you know, in less than, you know, three pages of single space text, the odds are you're not going to be able to get it done. I have a paper in the January issue of Health Affairs that looks at the practical uh, consequences of this idea. I, I think it's a train wreck waiting to happen. And unfortunately, because so many uh, providers, particularly community-based providers, are looking at this and saying, this is the future of Medicare payment, a lot of the care system redesign efforts that were actually written into the bill may not get either the attention or funding that they deserve because all the bandwidth is going to be taken up by the ACOs. One other thing to mention here is that one very important feature that will affect academic health centers is the creation in CMS, the federal agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid, of a dual eligibles office and a series of demonstrations about how to manage the catastrophically ill folks 
who are Medicare age or who are on Medicare because of disability but so poor they can't afford uh, the Medicare uh, premiums. This is one quarter of Medicare spending, one half of Medicaid spending. And those of you that read uh, Atul Gawande's remarkable article uh, in The New Yorker a few weeks ago about the hot spotters, that's basically who these folks are. Uh, I personally believe that if you were thinking strategically about the Medicare program, you'd want to learn everything you could possibly know about the dual eligibles and aggressively redesign the care systems and processes around those folks to try and help them get uh, either the care they need by the time they're incredibly sick or to get them into a healthier and more stable place where they're not coming into your institutions every two or three weeks. I mean, these are folks that have 20 or 30 hospitalizations in some cases in a year. There are patients that, you know, the, the residents in this room are taking care of that are just kind of going, we know they're going to be back, we aren't really helping them. Um, so I think if you were thinking strategically, you'd really want to be focusing on those folks and maybe taking some cues from the people that Atoll wrote about in his article about some of the things that we could be doing for the population of people that we have like those folks right in our own communities. So the last part of this, the completely restructured private health insurance market, um, we, I've spent a lot of time with the health insurers here in the last uh, three or four months, I can say to you with, in candor, they don't have the faintest idea what to do um, about this bill. It's sort of a good news, bad news thing for them. There are 15 or 20 million new customers for their product in the bill. And of course, as we know, the number of people getting private health insurance has been shrinking. The number of people that are actually insured, fully insured by private health insurers has shrunk a million people a year for each year in the last 10 years. So here's an opportunity to recoup 10 years worth of losses in enrollment in, you know, basically a couple years' time. But it is accompanied by an onslaught of regulation by really inexperienced regulators. And I must say, while I am in awe of the, the White House folks that have been working on this and also the people in CMS that are beginning to work on this, they have not gotten the first team uh, in the, uh, the health insurance regulation process. They're sort of second-tier state uh, insurance commissioners that are working on this stuff. There is going to be a tremendous amount of moral hazard-driven behavior, both by beneficiaries and employers, that will drive adverse selection in the health insurance pool, meaning that people who have an opportunity to sign up for something that they aren't going to necessarily pay for will uh, take advantage of that opportunity, and people that have to bear a significant amount of the cost will avoid uh, that cost to the extent that they will be able. And that will drive up cost in, in the, the, the private health insurance pool, and the cost of that adverse selection will be blamed on the insurers who are, you know, have been demonized uh, in this process politically. Uh, I think it is safe to say that there are tidal forces operating in this health insurance pool that the regulators really do not understand. Um, and it's worth noting here that while we concerned about Medicaid expansion, uh, potentially a lot of newly covered people that presently have no coverage, where the profits of institutions like this come from are from overcharging private insurers for the cost of caring for that private insured population. So your entire free cash flow as an institution and as pra practitioners comes from private insurance. So you really do have a stake in what happens here. You know, if you define radical as completely shutting down private health insurance, this was a moderate reform. If you define it based on the achievable changes in a trillion dollar healthcare market, however, it's far from moderate. The private health insurance pool in the United States is a trillion dollars. It is 7% of the gross domestic product. It's like bigger than the economy of Turkey or Mexico, just by itself. We are required to purchase the product, at least until the, the, the uh, Supreme Court rules on this. And there are huge political risks if the Congressional Budget Office forecast of limited rate increases as a result of this bill are wrong. If people are saying to you they are absolutely convinced that this bill is deficit neutral, you've got to, you've got to realize that none of those folks have the faintest idea of what care is going to actually cost in 2014 or how many people are going to sign up. And if you don't know those two things, you don't have the faintest idea 
of whether the bill is budget neutral, budget surplus, or budget deficit. So, I mean, this is just, was just an enormous gamble. That private health insurance pool is a, um, is a, a big, you know, trillion dollars. This is actually a picture of it taken from space. Um, uh, those of you that uh, remember the um, uh, wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, <laughs> a 600-foot um, ore tanker went down in that little bay in 30-foot uh, seas. I can tell you because I've read the law that there are not enough troops to patrol the entire lakefront of this pool of, of money. But the federal government and the whoever is in charge of the federal government in 2014, President Obama, President Romney, President Palin, President Trump, <laughs> boy, roll those over on you. <laughs> These really are scary times that we're living in. Whoever is president in 2014 is going to own the behavior of this pool even though they really don't have a navigational map <laughs> to explain what's going on underneath the surface or any idea of how it's going to behave when it's 30% bigger because the bill puts 300 million billion dollars more into this trillion dollar risk pool. So it's just, it's a project of Corps of Engineers dimensions. Uh, and I, it's just been a lot of fun kind of working with my actuary friends and my consulting friends to kind of war game out well, what could go wrong here. Um, I believe, based on my own analysis of, of the structure of the market, that we will see a tripling of the number of people in the most turbulent portion of that risk pool, which is the individual market. Because it is so much better a deal for employees under, say, forty or fifty thousand in uh, income to get their coverage through the exchanges than to get the coverage through their employers. So I think we're going to see there's about fourteen million people in the individual insurance market now. I happen to be one of them. I'm paying Anthem, the great Satan down there in <laughs> Richmond. Um, I'm paying them like eighteen hundred dollars a month. I am hoping that those rates go down a little bit as a result of this exchange. I think they will. Uh, and I think if the exchanges are set up, we could dramatically improve the affordability of individual insurance coverage if we're able to do the exchanges right and to keep the subsidies in place. The employer's influence over health insurance contracting strategies, however, will diminish. And that is not a good thing for academic medicine. Tiered networks differential cost sharing and risk shifting to providers are the likely consequence, which basically means that if you've got a clinical condition and you've got a $6,000 a night place to go to get it or a $12,000 a night place to go to get it, insurers will give you an economic incentive to go to the $6,000 a night place and shut off a lot of the flow of the patients with relatively routine medical problems not the catastrophic cases that we were talking about, but the people that could go in any number of different directions, they're going to probably, as a result of these changes, pay more to come here. Um, and I also think, because of the regulatory restrictions that are imposed in this bill, health insurers are going to have serious cash flow problems as this bill is being implemented, because their um, uh, incomes are going to be restricted by the law. The goal of the tiered networks would be to steer patients away from academic health centers for routine care, particularly ambulatory care. So if you guys were planning on having, you know, five to $7,000 MRIs supporting your institution, uh, I can guarantee you that patients are going to be paying more of that bill and being asked, asking questions like, where can we go to get this diagnostic workup besides going to a, a very high cost institution? So. You know, I, I want to leave some time for comments and questions here, but this is a strategy part. In other words, if I'm thinking strategically, I mean, I used to be in the dean's office of one of these places. I worried intensely about the future of my institution. I'm kind of putting that hat on now and thinking about the kinds of things that if I were in your shoes, I'd want to be worrying about and working on to try and deal with all this uncertainty. I believe that meritocracy and reverence for the science are pluses in an environment, an economic environment that requires making choices. So the fact that you know you you really are going to look to the science and you're going to try to make decisions that are in the patient's best interest based on evidence is really going to help you cope with an environment we are going to need to make choices and need to screen out 
clinical pathways and uh, particularly diagnostic routines that may not yield uh, results. This is kind of a complicated statement because it's what's happening in the medical community outside academic medicine is that it's sort of separating into two camps. A little bit like pediatric medicine where you had a group of people that practiced entirely inside the hospital and then you had a group of people that practiced in the community that never went to the hospital. That is beginning to happen in adult medicine as well. And a shrinking percentage of medical communities are, are involved in hospital-based practice and more and more institutions are hiring hospitalists, intensivists, uh, physicians that do nothing but manage patients in the institution, like house staff, only, you know, with, you know, uh, completely certified and all of that. So what's going on in, you know, the non-academic part of our medical care system is that the medical community is divided into two groups of people that don't really talk to one another or see one another much anymore. That is not the case here. For better or worse, you are a community. And you have a, uh, I, I believe, a, um, a lot of options as a community that the non-academic folks do not because the community, the, their medical communities are fragmenting. Clinical faculties, of course, cluster around training programs. And those training programs tend to cluster around people with common sets of clinical problems and also try to generate scientific evidence about what works and have aggressive discussions about what's the right thing to do in, a, in this particular clinical circumstance. We're going to need to engage in those types of questions and interactions more intensively as a result of this bill than we did before because resources are going to be limited by how payment changes are made to you. And I think as well, for better or worse, academic health centers have not been tainted by moral hazard driven medicine uh, you know, the oncologist, the private oncologist that has a PET scanner in his office and runs his patients through every three months. That just doesn't happen for the most part in places like this. So it, it's not like you've got some powerful, focused economic incentive to do things that are not necessary. Um, I think that's a very important plus, and it's going to be very hard for physician communities that have been built on that type of an approach the classic, uh, you know, Atoll's article on uh, McAllen, Texas was a, a good example of a community like that. There's not that McAllen ethos of mining the patient in academic medicine. And finally, and I can say this as a person that was in charge of organizing that political support, strong political support for your missions, teaching, research, and patient care has always been essential to defending the resource base of academic medicine, and it is going to be even more essential in the coming years. There are vulnerabilities, however. Um, you know, there is an unsustainable, uh, there have been you know, double-digit increases in flows of money from hospitals to medical schools in the last 15 years. Uh, and I think the average uh, hosp teaching hospital a day sends something like 85 or 90 million dollars a year across the street to the school. That is not going to be able to continue. And so how do the medical schools cope with the fact that this seemingly inexhaustible flow of resources is probably going to be brought to an end by the Medicaid payment cuts that I think are in our future and by the changes in private health insurance that will shut off cost shifting. Um, how to manage the relentless pressure for capital expansion. I mean, I explain to people, and you know, I go out to Las Vegas and they have 15% unemployment. And I talk to them about Charlottesville. We've got these construction cranes. Martha Jefferson's building a new hospital. You've got a new cancer center. You've got all this stuff going on. I mean, it's part of the reason why we didn't have a recession in, uh, in this town to the extent that a lot of other places did. But I mean, let me tell you, the construction cranes are going to fly south because we're not going to be able to continue to borrow the money that we've borrowed to finance these, and we're not going to be throwing off the same kind of cash that we have in the last few years. So this idea that you solve a problem by building a new building um, is something that we're going to have to wean our way uh, out of. Um, I also think, and this is a very hard thing, uh, and it's a hard thing here, is how to address the fragmentation of the care experience especially the continuity and care transitions. If we are organized around clinical problems and around departments, but we get patients whose clinical problems cross a lot of departments and they have to move through a complex, highly choreographed, we don't do that so well in academic institutions. And, and, it, and it doesn't seem to be improving very well. It's very hard. And even creating centers and moving people into multidisciplinary collaboration 
There are so many potentials for drop batons, particularly with the sickest patients. You're going to pay a price for those drop batons, not just because the patients are going to be unhappy and might not come back, but because you're not going to get paid for fixing the problems that result from poorly coordinated care. So I think that's going to be a big challenge. And then, you know, and this is sort of the $64 billion question, will clinical faculty embrace the need for change in clinical culture, both in practice and in teaching? This is going to be very, very difficult, particularly for people of my vintage. Uh, and then finally, the obliviousness to cost and clinical resource consumption is a great danger in fixed payment models, where there's only so much available for an admission to the hospital. We've had that for years. What are we going to do when there's a fixed payment for an episode of illness, including all the physician fees? How are we going to manage within those fixed limits? How are we going to get the clinical discipline to make sure that the patient's needs get met, but the resources are not wasted? Um, you know, this has been kind of an unreal environment. I mean, I remember my dean, my second dean, talked about the tooth fairy theory of economics, which seemed to uh, pervade a faculty discussion about resource issues, is that, you know, you, you, you needed money for a new program, we went to the dean, and he got it from the tooth fairy, or maybe he was the tooth fairy. Um, we're not going to have that, that, and actually, I, I kind of, I asked my graphics person, we're a grumpy tooth fairy, and that's what he sent me. I guess you'd be grumpy too if you had a Christmas tree growing out of your mind. But I think there, there is going to be a need to think about the relationship between resource consumption and the patient's well-being that perhaps wasn't uh, on people's minds so much. So the bottom line implications, uh, and again, non-political, doesn't really matter. I'm just talking as an advocate to you. You will be the largest single loser of resources if uh, this bill is repealed or not implemented as it was written, the largest single loser, because you have so many uncompensated patients and so large a Medicaid exposure. I believe that elegant diagnosis and risk-sparing clinical management are in our future. We need to learn how to do it, and then we need to teach it to our residents and fellows. Medical faculties will have to learn how to manage in a quasi-capitated environment. That is a fixed amount of money for a patient for a year or for an episode of illness. We're going to see more risk shifted onto these institutions, and the clinical team is going to have to somehow manage that risk based on best evidence and also based on their commitment to good outcomes for the patient. I also think that these institutions can become a learning laboratory to experiment aggressively with many of these new care models and relationships. And if it is the ACO, if it's uh, doing a better job for dual eligibles, there are a ton of both interesting and constructive opportunities to do a better job of taking care of patients buried in this bill. And there's also money to do it. So I, my argument is, hey, it's a little bit like the stimulus. There's $10 billion over the next 10 years to help us learn to do a better job of taking care of patients and learn how to make money under those new payment schemes. And I think it really behooves us to get in there and get some of that money and to set up centers for innovation in, in, in academic medicine and to get that process of changing the care models and changing the care process rolling. Um, and then finally, I think these institutions, both managements and faculties, are going to need to learn to run on regular gas because I don't think we're going to be getting premium gas out of this economic environment, whether health reform is implemented as it's written or not. Thank you all very much for not throwing anything. Thank you. That was a quick and uh, rich tour through um, some of the situations that face us right now. I'm going to come and take some questions. This is the Tell us who you are. <laughs> uh, my name is Carolyn Englehart, and I'm in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much, as always. Great job. So um, my question, oh, well, it's not really a question. I'd like your thoughts. We all know the difference between coverage and access. And the ACA expands coverage. Um, but my question to you is, particularly now with the budget stuff going on, talking about reduction in funds to maybe the community health center allotment and all of that, what can we expect with regard to how access will be for people under this bill? That's a great question, and I think it was largely lost in this process. 
Um, there were important changes that if they were fully implemented would make a difference in access. Community health center funding and capacity was roughly doubled. Uh, I think community health centers play a vital role in filling gaps, particularly since even at full implementation there are going to be 20 million people out there that still don't have health coverage. Uh, there were also efforts to try and stimulate uh, the growth in primary care physicians, uh, more primary care physicians, more advanced practice nurses. So I think fighting to preserve the funding for those coverage expansions is going to be extremely important. But I'm also of the view that the bill didn't go anywhere near far enough to change the payment models and to create an environment where young clinicians would choose primary care as, a, as an avocation. I mean, you know, medical students are, you know, smarter than the average bearer. You get into medical school, you get through the process, and you go, wait a minute. I've got $200,000 in debt, I can choose to be a family practitioner or a general internist and spend the rest of my life paying off my medical school loans, or I could go be an interventional cardiologist and be free to do what I want to do in three or four years. That's not a fair fight. And the 10% increases in Medicare payments uh, for uh, the uh, uh, evaluation and management codes, um, you know, a temporary increase in Medicaid payment for primary care physician services, totally inadequate. So I think, you know, we, I, I think we are, you know, if the coverage expansion takes place as it is, is implemented, I think you're going to see parallel with the coverage expansion uh, pretty much uh, the entire front end of the baby boom generation uh, leaving practice. And we're going to have a catastrophic shortfall of the frontline caregivers that are going to push a lot of folks into your emergency rooms. So I, I think the access thing, it was dealt with at a level of abstraction and without, I think, a real understanding of, of what it is that we're facing. Uh, so even if the bill were implemented as written, I still think we're going to have a terrible access problem. My name is Michael Swanberg. I'm a clinical instructor at the School of Nursing, and I'm here with a group of nursing students. Could you take a minute to talk about, I, I know your focus is on academic medicine, mm -hmm. but um, how this extends to uh, nursing education and nursing. Boy, oh boy. I mean, right out on the edge of my own ignorance, I think a lot of the care models that are going to be fostered by this bill are nursing intensive. Uh, they really do involve a more sophisticated and thoughtful division of labor between what physicians do and what nurses do. Uh, it's going to create a tremendous demand for advanced practice nursing. It's going to create a tremendous demand for team-based care in which nurses are absolutely vital participants. So I think it has a, a huge impact. There are a lot, there's money in the bill to try and expand nursing educators because it's been one of the constraints in trying to grow our nursing, uh, our, our, our nursing uh, workforce and person power. Uh, but, you know, again, that generational tidal wave that we're talking about here, the average age of a surgical nurse in the United States is, I think, around 50. And if we don't do something to significantly expand and strengthen our nursing workforce, by the time we get to 2020, we're going to have an 800,000 person shortage just of our ends. So, I mean, I, I have a whole talk on the people issues, but I'm really glad you asked that question. Are there any states that are not having a Medicaid problem, financing problem, and what is it they're doing so that they're not having a problem? I don't know of one. I mean, Medicaid is a chronic illness. It's either, you're either in intensive care or you're in acute care. Uh, there's no ambulatory Medicaid programs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe Bernhardt. I'm a community physician. Question about benefits. Um, if the plan is implemented as it's currently written, where will decisions about benefits, in particular, so new technologies where marginal cost is very high, marginal benefit is very low, where will that reside? Is that going to be a marketplace decision? Is that going to be a regulatory decision, a legislative decision, or is there sort of no discussion of that? Well, there was a lot of discussion, uh, and I think the, the argument for creating the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute was the belief that somebody out there ought to be making science-based decisions about what we cover and pay for. But when you read the law, the federal government is explicitly forbidden from using the results of the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute to do those things. So it's sort of like left kind of up in the air who makes the decisions. 
Who makes them now? Well, the Medicare program has a, an elaborate and largely transparent process that's really sort of vulnerable to vendor lobbying and, and uh, arm twisting. Uh, each individual private insurer has its own scientific review panels and processes, but because they are so concerned about their political image, they usually end up following Medicare. This bill did not meaningfully change the process by which technology is evaluated and approved for care, for, for our use. Made no meaningful changes. I'm Bob Chicago in pediatrics. I have a question about something I didn't hear you mention, and that is rationing of health care, right. however you call it. Uh, European countries seem to deliver uh, cheaper care with as good or better outcomes. And uh, how do you see the issue of, of rationing playing out for us? I can say, as someone who studied those health systems and has a lot of friends who work in them, that the main way they economize in care is by paying their providers and the pretty much the rest of the health system a whole lot less. Um, it, you know, I mean, everyone has horror stories about waiting lists in a lot of these countries, and there are waiting lists for a lot of high-tech services. But I think we squander so much money here in our country that the issue of denying people needed care. Uh, is something we really, I mean, we haven't reached that point. I really don't think we have. It's become a bloody shirt that the Tea Party folks are waving, that this is all about rationing. Part of the reason why I read the bill, um, believe me, they bent over backwards to avoid creating any structure that would deny people needed care. Bent over backwards. We have time for one more question or comment. Not to put them on the spot, but we could, well, I'm going to put you on the spot. Tell us who you are. Uh, just an observation about the uh, actions that can be taken uh, for which AHC should take responsibility now. I mean, it's fascinating. The, uh, I was thinking, as you spoke, of the recent mammography recommendations that were made in a sort of a structured way based on an analysis and that were created a storm of, 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 of reaction on the part of the people who said, well, I don't want that taken away from me, I, I want that available. And I was reflecting too on a recent study about the usefulness of uh, arthroscopy and, and uh, oste you know, osteo problems in the, in the knee. And only to find that even though there was a very clearly defined outcome of what was useful, what wasn't, the physicians just rejected that and said, "Well, that's you know my patients do better if I do this." It's a, and and so it gets into the whole behavioral nature of the usefulness of uh, clinical outcomes research within a community, and institutions like this ought to take that on. And I mean. It, it, if, if any focus in our whole, our structured system uh, is positioned so that it can develop this kind of information and then engage in the cultural modification that's necessary and to use as examples for others, it's institutions like these academic medical centers. So um, I don't, you know, we shouldn't be sitting by passively and, and watch a whole drama go past us here. There are things we can do now and that ought to be used to teach others uh, exactly what would be beneficial. So anyhow, you did a marvelous job, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I can simply say to you that I, I wasn't just buttering you up by arguing that, that, uh, uh, that meritocracy and a reverence for the science is an important asset because the issue of what goes on at the patient's bedside is really all about what's in the patient's interest and what do we know both about this patient's problem and about how we can help alleviate it that guides the decision. And faculty members need to defend to aggressive, thoughtful young people the course of, of, of action that's taken. They need to be morally responsible for that. That moral responsibility, for better or worse, is, is not as focused when you get away from the bedside in one of these places as it needs to be. Uh, and you know, the, the, I think the problem with the, the breast cancer thing was an absolute circus. And you will notice the administration backed away from it like a, like a, hot, uh, a hot poker. Um, and, and basically, so those were our people. Those recommendations were made by people appointed by the previous administration. I mean, the reality is there are a lot of people who do not trust our scientific uh, community, who do not trust the published data, 
who believe that uh, somehow this is a political process and not an objective one, well, the, the best remedy for that is having really rigorous, committed, evidence-focused work done in these places that informs how clinicians make care decisions. Because after all, we really do set those values. We, we set those values in the training process. Uh, I think academic medicine has a huge role to play in this. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I'd like to thank Jeff Goldsmith for a rigorous committee. <laughs> Thank you.